So welcome everyone. My name is John Heck. I have the fortunate, happy privilege to be here with Alex Lesnev, who's uh, got a lot of letters after his name, MBA, uh, CFA, a certified financial planner, which is no easy achievement uh, for that as well. And so we thought we would come together as a group and talk about um, essentially not just estate planning, so planning in the event of someone's death or incapacity, but also once it's protected in those two events, how are we going to grow it? Let's say you have small children and you've got left a nice little uh, set of assets for their beneficiaries. It shouldn't just sit there and kind of get eaten away by inflation. So Alex is our resident expert on that. Um, and so we can talk about not just how to do a good plan, but also how to, once you create it, how do you protect and grow it? And in theory, generate uh, that wealth for multi-generations. I mean, you can have trusts that last for generations or that pour over into future trusts that last for generations. And if you have that time, again, Alex will talk more about this, I'm sure, but that time value of money is, is huge, right? If you have extra yeah. time when your family to grow that, you can really get that wealth. Uh, growth and investing, like a lot of things, is not linear, it's exponential. <laughs> and so those numbers right. can really, really get, uh, get really high, obviously, with more time. So with that, without further ado, I'll start with the, uh, oops, sorry about that, uh, with a quote uh, from those who don't know, George Burns was a very famous comic, lost about 100 years ago and loved his cigars. Um, uh, but uh, we want to make sure <laughs> that sadly we all have to die, whether we can afford it or not. I'm going to is, and we've covered this in other webinars as well, but just kind of broadly, what is estate planning? It's basically having someone make decisions for you when you can't. Uh, you can type it in the chat or, or if you like or not, but e every adult who's over the age of 18 needs a minimum of three documents, no matter what, right? They're kind of here. Um, the basics would be having a will, having a healthcare directive, and then having a preferably durable power of attorney. So if you're unconscious in a coma, whatever, um, then you're going to, have everything covered for both your person and your assets, right? Um, if you have a revocable trust and then can put assets in that, that's a great way um, to keep families out of court and out of conflict, right? Um, so I would say every adult, we would say every adult between 18 and kind of death should have some sort of plan in place. Um, interestingly, the legislature agrees with you. All states everywhere have a government's estate plan for you. Um, it's not easy. It's somewhat cumbersome. If we die, that process is called probate. And if we're incapacitated, that process is called a guardianship and conservatorship. It can eat away a lot of your own personal wealth just when the fees associated with hiring lawyers, going to court and everything else. And it can really cause some family strife. So when we say keep families out of court and out of conflict, that's kind of what we're talking about. Let's get into a bit, a bit more just over again. This is an overview, but kind of some. Um, more advanced discussion topics. Um, first of all, if you ha if we have children under 18, any of us that have kids, uh, we know, of course, that if you're under 18, you can't really own anything, right? When you turn 18, you're instantly an adult, whether you're ready or not. Uh, the only thing you can't do, of course, is drink. Um, but under 18, we have guardians called our parents, um, or if we're, you know, have a, a guardian just appointed because maybe it's grandma, whoever, right? But if you have a minor child or a child who's uh, dependent upon you, say they have supplemental needs, um, they're also going to need what we call a kids protection plan. And that's a plan that's going to outline short term guardian, a long term or permanent guardian until they turn 18 and also get some way of transferring assets to them. So you don't just give it to you, hope we'll spend it on your kids. You actually have a, a locked in plan to make sure those kids are taken care of in the way you want, by the people you want, and then uh, with the amount of money that you want. Right. So we want that. The second thing is for most of our clients and most families, we recommend a revocable living trust, also called a revocable trust. Right. These trusts are great. Uh, it's essentially a transparent organization that you form for your family and it's revocable. So you're still in control. You can change it. You can turn it on, turn it off, amend it however you want. Um, and it allows for control for in the event of your death or incapacity. One of the things it does not do is provide asset protection in terms of creditor protection because it's essentially a disregarded entity for the IRS, which means that if you get sued, it doesn't matter if it's in your revocable trust, they're all going to say it's really you that owns it. And if you own it, you can lose it. Right. So we can get into more advanced planning strategies for any client that might have different needs on 
uh, tax avoidance on uh, how to protect those assets while you're alive and um, have capacity and can do what you want with it, right? And so we do have different strategies to kind of take care of that. And the third bullet here is estate taxes, um, which is very much a political number. So uh, a quick a quick primer on taxes themselves. In the For about 30 or 40 years of this country's history, um, estate taxes didn't really exist until 1911. Um, but for about 30, 40 years of that, a tax, any amount that a family had over $800,000 of wealth, that amount over that was taxed at 40%. That 40% tax, it's still there. But what's happened is over the years, and again, politics and everything else, the number currently sits, I'll use 2024 because we're almost there, at $13.6 million per person. And if you're married, it can be uh, ported over or given to your spouse for a total of, you know, math in public, right? But $27 million. Most people have no federal tax problem, right? Virginia, uh, many years ago, abolished their state estate tax. So clients in Virginia at least have no estate tax problem. Um, having said that, that federal number is a very much a political number and it can and does change. And in January of 2026, it will sunset back to the old numbers before the current law. So we always want to look at that, right? And we always want to keep around that. It's part of our job as a law firm. And Alex, I'm sure he keeps pretty close watch on it as oh, well. Yeah. But that could get into a state, into advanced planning strategies, hmm not only how we transfer our wealth, but keep it out of the government's tax uh, hands as well. Um, why do they have an tax at all? Uh, the IRS calls the estate tax a tax on your right to transfer your property to someone else when you die, right? So that's a uh, ouch, but anytime we transfer wealth, whether we find a $20 bill on the street um, or give our wealth when we pass away, all of those events are taxable events. So we wanna make sure that those tax consequences are looked at as well, right? And then for anyone watching the webinar uh, and for our clients too, we say, well, this is great, but how does it apply to me? Well, are, is you and your family at risk, right? What if I have those basic three documents, a will, um, a durable power of attorney and medical directives? Well, that's great. Uh, did you do it 20 years ago? Um, did you do it online with LegalZoom or, or maybe Susie Orman's plan and you're not really sure what it does? Um, if you don't have any plan, you're at the highest risk because the government will do something if you're in the hospital and you can't make your own decisions. Uh, if you don't have uh, a plan that's been updated, we say minimum update time is within the last three years um, or any major life change, then you're also at risk, right? And for the record, don't let a major life change be your incapacity because if you don't have a plan and then become incapacitated, you cannot make a plan. Another thing that might be at risk is uh, you don't have coordinated planning. So let's say there's three generations in your family, you all kind of get along uh, or not. But if you don't know what you're going to inherit, then it's at risk. The average inheritance in the United States is gone in 18 months, right? Most people don't have the ability to really understand even an inheritance. Well, it's like when the lottery or get a big inheritance, they don't really have the mindset to kind of keep it. That's why it just kind of vanishes. Um, one estate planner uh, called this model the dump, divide, defer, dissipate. Current estate planning in America is we dump the money on someone. We divide them on our beneficiaries. We defer any taxes if we owe them, and then it dissipates in 18 months, right? We think our families and clients can do better than that. Um, the other thing you might be at risk is if you don't have an inventory, we call it a family wealth inventory, but if you don't have an inventory of your assets, right? So you may have 20 different accounts, but if something happens and you're gone and your kid or your uh, trustee or your executor can't find it, and they're going to go digging through your files and everything else, but they can't find it because you didn't make it easy for them. It could get lost forever to this depart the State Department of Unclaimed Property. Um, today in Virginia, there's over $2 billion in the Department of Unclaimed Property. And Virginia wants someone to just come and get it. But if they don't know it's there in the first place and you're gone, how are they going to find it? Right. So we want to make sure your assets can be found and distributed in the way that you want. And then finally, if you don't have an ongoing relationship with a lawyer or another professional like Alex, um, then that could be problematic because. How are you going to know what the law have changed or the financial rules have changed? How are you going to know what's the latest strategy on either tax planning, financial planning, or estate planning, right? You, you want to make sure those things are updated. And so we're going to make sure that that's going to be an ongoing relationship with an attorney. And to help us out with that, 
we're going to work with Alex. So Alex, we're again, we're so happy to, to have Alex uh, help us out with this awesome presentation. Uh, he's definitely what I think we would all call an expert, right? He's the uh, founder and CEO of Capital Squared Financial. Um, he specializes, you can see it here, but proactive tax planning, investment strategies, retirement planning, and similar to legacy lawyers, he's focused on an outcome and not just kind of getting a one and done. Hey, let me just uh, get whatever, invest in a mutual fund for you. And then we're done. He's going to look at that customer centric focus right and make sure that it actually matches his clients in a very one-on-one -on -one individualized approach uh certainly qualified mba like we talked about earlier certified financial planner cfa um and then uh, we're also going to leave you with his contact information at the end of this as well so you can reach out to him if you have not already and alex so without further ado if you're ready i will be happy to turn it over uh, turn the mic over to you uh thanks thanks so much john for this introduction and it's great to collaborate with you it's a great series of events that you have um, for your audience and of course for your clients. I mean, great. I actually looked at the previous two. Again, I'm glad, I'm really glad you're doing this. So in terms of my you know, section of the webinar, these are the topics we're going to discuss or you know, subject areas, if you want to put it that way. We'll talk about the dangers of investing too conservatively in retirement. And I'll actually give you a specific example of what I mean by that. Uh, we'll talk about what it takes to create a retirement specific plan. There's a lot of confusion actually between a general financial plan and a retirement specific uh, plan. We'll talk about different portfolio protection mechanisms. Again, I'll include some examples so you know exactly what, what I'm referring to. And then since we are getting closer and closer to the end of the year, we'll talk about different tax efficient implement you know today you still have time or potentially you know keep in mind um, for the future for the next year next slide please John next slide please yeah so are you investing too conservatively and why is this a problem so Susan, and of course, this is this is one of my clients, but it's not her real name and it's not her real photo. But there, there are actually some similarities, which is why I, I picked this specific um, photo. So she reached out to me earlier this year. I believe we talked in, in April. Uh, so she is single, recently retired. She received, you know, say significant re inheritance from her aunt. And she's been managing her finances to the most um, so there was essentially no plan in place besides, you know, some of the ideas that she tried to implement. She was concerned about the investment performance of her accounts, and that's really why she reached out to me. So prior to the meeting, of course, I requested that she you know, provides all of her documents, her information, and it became quite apparent, you know, why, again, she reached out to me. So she kept so much in cash. If I remember correctly, close to a third of all of her liquid assets was just sitting in cash because she was overly conservative. In terms of her investments, in terms of her brokerage accounts, if you actually look at what was inside of them, well, most of the funds were invested in money market and bond funds. So again, ultra conservative investments. If you, if you look at the statements over time, it was actually very helpful to see it. Well, the, the value has not been trending up, which is again, a big concern when you invest this conservatively. And again, this is one of the things that usually becomes quite apparent from the very beginning, but there was no written plan in place. Because again, there was, she didn't want to take essentially any risk. She didn't have a very good understanding of what it would look like in the long run. So she was essentially just guessing. So next slide, please. So in preparation for our meeting, this is actually what I showed Susan. I was like, well, Susan, this is what it would potentially look like if you continue as is. So at this point, if you look at the bottom of this slide, um, she had roughly a third of her portfolio in stocks and roughly 70% in different bonds and cash-like investments. It was a 30-70 you know, allocation. So, you know, we talked about different things and I will, you know, skip on that for, for a moment, you know, her specific situation. And I essentially compared to what it would look like 
if she decides to rebalance her portfolio toward the more balanced mix, which is usually considered to be 60% stocks and 40% bonds. So in the long run, and of course, past performance results are not always indicative of the future, but her portfolio at the time was expected to earn anywhere between 4 to 45%, and the suggested portfolio was right around six percentage points. So on the surface, it may not sound like such a huge difference, even though, again, if you work with $100,000, well, over the next 20 years, and John talked about the time value of money concept, well, the difference is actually $72,000, and that's in today's dollars, so it's quite significant. Next slide, please. Now, what you're looking at here, this is actually exactly the same calculation, but it's more applicable you know, to Susan in this case because her portfolio value was you know, relatively close to a million dollar mark. So in her case, again, when we talked about $72,000, which is a lot of money, what about $720,000 that you're potentially leaving on the table by investing too conservatively, specifically early in your retirement? which is when people usually make that mistake. And again, we'll dive into that more in terms of why that's a problem. Of course, how can you possibly use the money? I'm sure you can imagine lots of options. You can simply enjoy your retirement more, you know, perhaps travel more, perhaps you know, buy a second home or you know, things of that nature. Long-term care, that's one of the biggest concerns and that's one of the reasons why people actually reach out to me to begin with they want to you know they want me to to help them analyze how well they're prepared for that and of course in the you know in the context of our webinar today in terms of you know preserving you know more funds for the next generation well this is one way to accomplish that again by not investing too conservatively you know early in up uh, next slide please so the question that you really need to ask and you know sometimes we wouldn't necessarily ask it this way but you know since this is a webinar i guess this it's okay to make my point but will you outlive your funds i mean that's really one of the most important ideas that needs to be addressed as part of your retirement specific plan so usually when we start working with our clients unless they tell us otherwise we assume that they'll be in retirement to age 95. now what does that mean let's say an average person is going to retire at the age of 65 and i understand it can be 70 it can be early 60s but let's just make it 65. That means that you know the funds they have need to <coughs> for 30 years. Typical business cycle in, in the United States, by the way, is seven years. So you're looking at you know four to five business cycles. It's important again that people are prepared for that. Now, one of the issues, which is normal, but it needs to be addressed, most people, again, they focus too much on market volatility. You know, well, the markets are down by 10%. You know, what would happen if my portfolio is down by 15% in three months? And sure, you, it needs to be addressed, but those are short-term risks. And markets are, they're, you know, ever-changing. They're always been, and will probably remain volatile and there are ways to deal with that. But a much bigger issue in the long run, it's really inflation and so-called longevity risk, which is really a different way of, of um, um, referring to, to the idea of outliving your money. So uh, what you really need to have is a written retirement plan. And I, again, I, I, on purpose, I crossed the financial piece and, you know, we, because there's a big difference again between a, between a typical financial plan and a retirement specific plan. What are the differences? Well, perhaps these are the top four. Uh, a, a high quality retirement plan will analyze what would happen, let's say with your cash needs in the long run under different stress test assumptions. So here's a perfect example for you. What would happen to your cash flow if you decided to retire in the beginning of a year such as 2020, when the markets were down by 31% in 17 calendar days? Exactly how would you sustain you know, your, your cash needs, your portfolio distributions in that given year, of course, in that given period, and then also in the long run, what protection mechanisms do you have in place? 
a retirement plan needs to account for contingencies. And long-term care would be a perfect single, or you know, if you're married, if both of you need that type of care, perhaps only one of you, exactly how will you afford that? To work with you know, parents who are thinking about retirement, but they have children with disabilities. So of course they have to account for that too. You need to have a clear distribution plan. And that is again what most, I would say, what most general financial plans are lacking. So you have a number, let's say that number is $10,000 per month as an example, but exactly how would you take the money out of your accounts? Are you going to begin with your brokerage accounts first? Are you going to draw of your brokerage and IRA accounts? Are you gonna use your Roth IRA? So all of that needs to be in place. And of course, in terms of the tax efficiencies, we'll, we have separate slides on that too, but there is a big difference. Again, when someone is accumulating money, meaning they're not drawing from their accounts, usually there's really not that much you can do in terms of the tax efficiencies. There are still some strategies, but when you begin to draw and efficiently, that can make, I won't say it can result in a drastic difference in terms of again what you what you're able to distribute to yourself next slide please so how to protect your portfolio so there are multiple ways and i'll just describe one of them in our webinar today so it's a mathematical way mathematical approach that we apply to every single client that we work with, you know, who's thinking about transitioning or in retirement. Here, so her portfolio value is right around eight hundred thousand dollars. Susan is risk averse, which is not surprising. You know, most people are risk averse, even though you know not necessarily everyone. And in her case, we determined that she has you know an above average, which is important. So our first step was, term, was to determine her actual portfolio cash needs. So we went through this whole budgeting exercise. Some people in that, other people perhaps not so much, but we had to go through that. We also determined that she has you know, significant pension on social security income, which certainly helps. So that replaces a portion of her income. So net of that, net of, um, her social security and pension, she needs $4,000. Of course, that is inflation adjusted. So that's part of the model that we're building for her. Now, that's step one. Step two is to annualize that, of course. We need to figure out how much um, she needs per year and then multiply. And for those of you who noticed I, I mentioned that earlier that's that's the average business cycle in the us and we want all of our clients who are in retirement to be protected for at least seven years so that again when the markets go from the top to the bottom and then from the bottom to the top they're not forced to sell any of their stocks um, at a bad time essentially so that gives us 336,000 in this case we take that number divided by the total portfolio value and that results in the 40, 42% suggested allocation to bonds. So 42% in stocks, 58% in bonds. So what's important here, if any of you work with one of those you know, big wire houses, very frequently they would adjust your allocation simply based on your age. Something along the lines of, well, you're you know, 70 years old, and you just have to invest more conservatively because you're 70 years old. We don't do that. We want to adjust it based on our client specific cash needs. You can do, and we usually do that. Again, I will admit it um, from the discussion today. But of course, for someone who has a larger portfolio, usually there's an option to um, invest more in dividend paying stocks. So you don't even have to dip that much into the principal value of your portfolio. And of course, vice versa. For someone who has a smaller portfolio, they usually need to have more in bonds because you know they, they may not be able to take that much risk. Um, but again, the most important idea is to essentially isolate you know, up to seven years, sometimes even more of your from market risk. Next slide, please.
Okay. Um, John, can you hear me? I can. Is that not the correct slide? Okay. No, it just kind of disappeared for a moment here. Sorry, just just a moment, please. Um, All good with the sound? You got the sound? I can hear you loud and clear. Great. It just for some reason disappeared in my end. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. So here's a couple of I was thinking about making you know more specific examples, but then I thought perhaps I would just aggregate them into one slide so you know, you know, again where I'm coming from. So let's say you decided to retire in March of 2020. And this is not any exaggerated you know, situation. This is actually what happened, well, essentially a little more than three years ago at this point. Again, for those of you who remember, during the month of March of 2020, by 31% in over 17 calendar days. It was a very dramatic market meltdown. So if you were you know, a young retiree without a written plan in place, and again, it's very important to have a written plan in place, well, that significantly increases the probability of you panicking and selling your stocks at the wrong time. And unfortunately, I do know quite a few people who ended up doing exactly that because they're so used to those rosy projections when everything is going up. And then again, when one morning they wake up and they're missing you know, a third of their portfolio, that resulted in a panic. Now, some of those people, because they reached out to me later, we had to rework their plan. And I will share this with you. They essentially had to retire for the second time. Basically told them, well, look, we can continue as is, but then we'd have to reduce your portfolio distributions because you sold everything. So now we have to reinvest. The second option is, well, if you decide to work for a few more years, and then perhaps you can retire then. And of course, goes without saying, this, this scenario, so everything I just discussed, this is not optimal to say the least. This is not what anyone would want to happen. Now, if you have a written plan in place, what would you do then? Well, first of all, again, because you have that buffer, what I described a moment ago, well, that increases, significantly increases the probability that you would simply stay invested, which is a big, big. Now, perhaps you even decided to take advantage of the market turbulence. Why? Because, you know, prior to the event, you stress test your own assumptions and you know what it would look like when the markets are down by 20, 30, sometimes even 40% which is applicable in some sense, regardless of, of what happens in the market. At the very least, you know, the idea of harvesting losses for tax purposes. You're not, you know, so panicked that you're not doing literally anything. So that's, that's something you can do, again, regardless if you're thinking about retirement, you know, in retirement or, you know, 20 years away from it. So lots of ways to take advantage of that if you have a plan in place. Next slide, please. 